I want us to think about this situation, okay? But let's try and use the tools that we have in terms of mathematics to do this, okay? So draw yourself up a set of axes. Just give me the first quadrant. You'll see why in a second. What I want us to imagine is this ball and the measurements we took over time, okay? Now, because I was throwing the ball up and down, I want to think about this displacement in up and down terms. So I'm going to call this axis here the x-axis. You know how when you learn coordinate geometry for the first time in the Cartesian plane, um, you're like, it's always x and y. Do we always really need to label the axes? And your math teacher's always said, yes, yes, you must label the axes. Yes, we want to dark marks, blah, blah, blah. Part of the big reason why is directly to lead up to this, okay? For motion, it's absolutely essential that you have your axis level so you know what you're talking about, okay? So there's our x, our displacement. What I'm going to do horizontally here, right, is not that the ball's moving horizontally, but I'm thinking about the ball at different points in time, okay? So I've got a, a displacement axis and a time axis, okay? Time zero, that's when you hit go on your stopwatch, okay? So where was the ball at that time? Now, I suppose you could say I was holding it here, and that's like, I don't know, like 1.3 meters off the ground or something like that, okay? So I suppose you could call it, we started at 1.3, okay? But being that it started there, and at least I tried to end there as well, right? We might as well call this the origin. I'll make it the origin, okay? So therefore, at time zero, I'm at zero, okay? Now, um, it took some number of seconds and it went through the air. Eventually, it came back down and I caught it, right? So we're going to come back down to the axis like so. And um, what, was the, uh, what was the longest one? When I threw it furthest in the air, what was the time measured for how long it was in the air? Like three seconds? Something like that? Two? Two? I'm going to call it four just for the simplicity of numbers, okay? Just as, as an example, okay? Now, we want to consider this in terms of maths, right? So right now we've entered an imagined world. For that reason, I'm, I'm ignoring all kinds of things that make the situation more complicated, okay? So I know that the ball was somewhere up in the air. Now, when I took all of your numbers, right, it was pretty close to between halfway in between. It wasn't exactly, but there were lots of problems with that. Like people who said, you know, this was two, this was two, and this was 0 0.6 or something like that, okay? So <laughs> therefore, I'm just gonna simplify a little bit and call it halfway. At time two, we were up in the air. Now, where would you guess that we stopped? What did it feel like? What did it look like? Five meters? Six meters? I'm, I'm, I'm 1.78 or something like that. It went at least three times higher than my height, right? Like if it's here. So I'm gonna call it, I'm going to call it six. Okay. Now you told me, you told me that up here is when it sort of stopped for a brief moment in time. Okay. Now what would that look like? Well, in terms of graphs, we call these points, we have names for them. Right? We call them stationary points because guess what? At that moment in time, which is a moment, it really is just a moment, the ball is stationary. It's not going anywhere. It's not going up and it's not going down. It's just floating there for a split second, right? That's why it's called a stationary point, right? And then what happens to either side? Well, you've got to come back down to the axis. Um, does it come down like this? Why not? Uh, okay, you told me the speed changed, right? Now remember, this is a linear function, right? The thing about linear functions is that they don't change speed. It's going at a constant rate all along the way. And you know that because dx and dt for that guy is a constant, right? So we have to ditch this guy. Instead, to account for the fact that it's slowed down, we're getting this kind of shape. Okay? Now, you also said that as it came back down, right? It was going fastest as I caught it, right? So therefore, this speed is doing the same thing on this side as it was doing over here, right? It's coming down and it lands. Okay. Now, quick question. What happened as time went five, six, seven, eight? What was happening to the ball?
Why is it doing this? It was, it was it, okay? Um, even though, you know, actually I didn't drop the ball, did I? I don't think I ever dropped it. So it was always, it never got any lower than the origin, my hand, okay? Now this is where this graph, right, which you are very familiar with its shape, this is where it goes. But it's not where the ball goes, right? And the same way, you know, I don't have any, like what was the ball doing before? It was just in my hand, at the origin, okay? So therefore, we need to say this thing is restricted. Don't you love restrictions? I know you love restrictions. We've got a time restriction, don't we, right? Zero to four. There's my time restriction, okay? Now this is a very, very simple shape. It's very simple. Um, luckily for you, it actually is exactly what it looks like, okay? Um, which is a parabola, okay? So we know how to describe parabolas. Just like in exponential growth and decay, we observe something and we think about the mathematical things we know that fit the pattern, right? A parabola fits this, okay? So what kind of parabola would it be? Well, it has roots at zero and four, doesn't it, right? So you automatically know what kind of form is it going to be in. X equals what? If zero and four are roots, as it were, right? It should be t outside of t minus four. That's got roots at zero and four, doesn't it? So I know that. The problem with this guy, though, is that um, he doesn't match this, does it, right? Why? What's wrong with this? This, this is concave up, isn't it? This, this looks like this, right? You know because it's got a T squared there. But my ball is not an anti-gravity ball, so what should I do to adjust it? I should flip it upside down. Now, that's not all. Does this account for what I've got? Let's try something. Let's try time equals zero. Does it work? Yes. It does. Time equals four? It, does it work? Yes. It does, and that's, that's because we accounted for that when we made up the equation, right? Ah, but time equals two. What happens when time equals two? You get x equals minus two times two minus four, which is also minus two. You get four. That's not as high as I want to go, is it? So how do I change it? You got a couple of choices, don't you? You could say, I'm at four, but I want to be at six. So you could just add two to everything. That would get you six, right? But there's a problem with doing that. What's the problem? It fixes this point, but then it marks up these guys because they won't be at zero anymore, will they? They'll be moved up like the rest of it, okay? So I abandon. I abandoned this idea of adding a constant. What else could I do? I could multiply. Now multiplying is a better idea. One of the ways you could have seen that apart from guesswork is that if I think about this one that I've fashioned, all right, what would it look like in relation to what I plotted? Uh, well, four is, four is there, right? I know exactly what this looks like. It looks like this. Now what's that? This is another way you could have known that just adding a constant would not give you the shape that you wanted, right? In fact, what I want is a stretching out of the same shape that I guessed, okay? So that's why I should multiply it by what factor? Three on two, Three on two one and a half, right? Because um, six is one and a half lots of four, okay? So that's what I'm going to do. There you go. Does it match? Does it match? It looks like it matches all of the points and the general kind of curvature, right? Let's push on this a little further. Let's explore it. This is just displacement here, okay? So, here's the magic of maths, right? You don't need to do any guesswork or rely on observation. You can rely on maths that you know for certain and is precise. What is the x on dt? Shall I expand this? Maybe that'll make it a little easier. This is negative 3 over 2t squared plus 6. Yeah. Uh, 6t. There we go. Got the double negative. Great. Okay. So what's the derivative? Negative 3t plus 6. That looks like right. Okay. Now, does this match? Why don't we graph this? Then, rather than looking at theme at specific points in time, we can consider the whole thing. Okay? So, I'm going to get a new set of axes, because I don't want to confuse it too much with this. 
Um, <laughs> negative 3t plus 6, what does it look like? Well, you've got a y-intercept of 6. Ooh, I was naughty. What did I miss? Um, the the axes. axes, thank oh, you. Okay. This is another reason why you've got to be careful with because you're going to frequently get graphing the velocity and graphing the acceleration. So this is velocity against time. So I've got my 6. What's happening to the rest of the graph? Where's it going? It's dropping like a rock, right? Okay. Now, what's this intercept over here? It's, um, it's 2, right? Wait a second. My graph keeps going. This thing keeps on going all the way up to 4, right? So in fact, this, this graph needs to go as well. The domain restriction that applied over there should be the same as here, right? So in fact, if that's 2, then 4 must be around here. I'm going to keep going all the way over, like so. Okay. So I really should put these filled endpoints here to indicate the graph stops, right? Because that's the only place it's defined. So does this match? Does it match? Does it make sense? Let's think about it, shall we? At the start, what was the velocity? Well, it was positive. What does that correspond to? What was the ball doing? It was moving upward, right? Moving upward, okay? So that makes sense. As the ball got closer to time 2, which is where it stopped, the ball was slowing down. It was still moving up, but it was slowing down. Okay. So far, so good. What's happening over here? The ball drops. It starts to return to my hand. Okay. Now, at what point does it actually stop? Or should I say, what velocity is it? What is the x dx on dt intercept that corresponds to time 4? Well, it's going to be minus 3 times 4, which is negative 12, plus 6, it's negative 6. Now, what this model predicts is that the speed that, I, that it was going at when I threw it, speed, is the same speed as what it was when it landed. Okay? Now, obviously, if you say in terms of velocity, they're directly opposite, because one's up and one is down. Okay? Does that match? Hmm. If you throw a ball up harder, does it come back to you faster? Hmm. At lunchtime, you can go and experiment. <laughs> right, now, we looked at displacement, we looked at velocity. There's one last piece, isn't there? There's acceleration, right? So that is d squared x on d t squared. Okay, now, again, wearing your calculus hat, you know exactly what acceleration is equal to. What's it equal to? It's just negative 3. What does that mean? So the first thing is, I don't feel the need to graph this because it's constant. The acceleration is, is never changing. Right? Now this is one of the reasons why the accelerating decelerating language is a problem. Because when we talk about this, like if we forget that we're in maths, right? And think about, is this accelerating or decelerating? I think we would normally say between 0 and 2, it's decelerating. Because it's, it's slowing down. That's what you told me. And then we got there and it stopped moving. And then we would say, after that, it starts accelerating towards the ground until I catch it. Right? But that doesn't, that doesn't back up this at all, does it? doesn't make sense. The language that we use either has broken the model or the model has broken the language. Okay? Now, being that we can see this is all consistent and it made sense, okay? I'm going to go with the fact that, like English, it's just, it's confusing. And it doesn't, it, it wasn't designed to match mathematical reality. It was designed to fit, well, normal language and everyday use, right? Which is not talking about this. So we said it's constant. It's negative. It's negative. It's always negative. Why is that? Hmm. What does this correspond to? Um, acceleration is a bit tricky. Uh, it's related to, but not the same as, the idea of a force. Right? That something is trying to slow down or speed up in a certain direction. There's something, this guy, right? 
which is constantly, constantly, no, literally, constantly, <laughs> changing this so it's always decreasing. That's what it's doing, right? Uh, what does it correspond to? What it corresponds to for us is gravity, right? From, well, not even the second I let go of the ball, right? Even while I'm holding the ball, gravity is accelerating it downwards. Now, what's stopping it at the moment is um, the electrons in my hand and the strongly... I won't, I won't get into it, okay? But um, gravity is acting on it and it's always acting on it, right? And it's still acting on it when I release. It's acting on it in exactly the same way the whole time, okay? Now, remember we made up all these numbers and fashioned them all, okay? But we can know that this whole model is actually quite off. I'll tell you how. Um, what unit is our time axis in? It's in seconds, right? Now, we started presupposing that the x-axis, the displacement, was in meters, because that's a normal sort of unit for that, right? Meters, meters, okay? So it stands to reason, therefore, that the displ displacement equation gives us this, in meters, because that's the unit of displacement. When you've got displacement and time, and time's being divided, it's on the bottom, right? You've got meters per second, right? Yeah, careful, stay with me. There's one unit of um, length here, right? There's one unit of length here. How many units of length are there here? Still one, because the squared is not on the x, right? It's on the how many times you differentiate, right? So this is still meters. How many time units are there here? None. How many time units here? One. How many time units here? There are two. Or alternatively. Okay. Because it's about a velocity change per time. Right? If you want to think about it that way. Okay. Um, just to confuse you further, right? you know how I said x dot and x double dot, right? Because it's velocity, it just as frequently gets called v for velocity, right? Which makes this a for acceleration, but it also means that because acceleration is how velocity is changing over time, it's dv on dt. That's a pain, isn't it? People in their notation. It is confusing though. Thankfully, it's mostly self-explanatory. Um, now, by the way, that's why this often gets written as meters per second to the power of minus two, right? Like that's just index notation here. And this is the point at which I know all of our numbers were actually pretty inaccurate, right? Because what is gravity? It's not minus three meters per second squared. It's it's closer to ten, isn't it? Nine point minus nine point eight if you're thinking about velocity. Okay. So therefore, if we wanted to, we could say, ah, uh, that's bogus, because I know what that is, right? So we can change this, and I can go back up, instead of by differentiating, I would integrate, which you can do, 